Well, let's get started. So welcome everyone. Uh, on behalf of the WEFI organizers, the, I'll use that acronym a lot, Workshop on Entrepreneurial Finance and Innovation. I'd like to welcome you all to the fourth of our uh, lecture series. So as a reminder, this lecture series presents uh, topics organized by leading researchers on entrepreneurial finance and innovation. The goal is to provide an overview of what we think, at least, are important and emerging topics in the field. Uh, we hope to encourage um, sorry, I was checking we had something. Uh, we hope to encourage and facilitate more high quality research and PhD education. Everything's going to be recorded and online uh, for those of you uh, who want to check back on this later. So this year we have a lineup of five remaining speakers after today and one more panel discussion. Take a look at the speaker lineup. I put the link in the chat and we look forward to your active participation. So with that, today we're really happy to welcome Joan Ferrimensa. Uh, Joan is an Associate Professor of Finance at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He's got previous stints at Northeastern and Harvard Business School. Today he's going to be presenting on private versus public firms, where he will describe the differences between financing, investment, innovation policies of those two organizational forms, and connect those differences to choices of listing status. Beyond being an excellent co-author, Joan is the perfect person to present on this topic given his extensive work on how these two organizational forms differ. He, of course, has other important work, including topics on innovation, patenting, and measuring financing constraints. I'm really looking forward to what Joan has to say today, and I, I think he will as well. Before I hand it off, a few notes on the format. If you have a clarifying question, just raise your hand. Uh, myself or Song uh, will um, try to unmute you if, if the timing is right. Um, Think of these, these interruptions as clarifying questions, but Juan has added within his talk some sort of st natural stopping points where he could pause and see if there are any clarifying questions. So if you feel like you know, something really needs to be answered, I have a feeling if you wait five or 10 minutes, there'll be an opportunity. Um, but with that, I'm happy to hand it off to Juan. You have about an hour and I guess five to 10 minutes. Take it away. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. It's, it's a true honor to be part of this lecture series. And Thank you to you and your co-organizers for organizing not only this, but also the seminar series. This, I mean, this has been one of the highlights of this whole kind of lockdown COVID situation. So at least it's good to see that, you know, there are some silver linings out there. Um, so as, as Michael said, I'm going to be talking about public versus private firms. And let me just kind of begin with a, a disclaimer. Um, I'm going to try to, you know, provide a broad overview of the literature and the main issues on on this research area, but um, it's, there's there's a lot of papers out there, and this is a, a quickly growing literature. So I'm sure I've forgotten things. Uh, some of them, you know, I just didn't have time for them. Some of them I can blame. I have a small daughter now, who is seven months old. So it's you know it's becoming a bit tougher, particularly with COVID and everything else, to you know stay uh, on top of everything. So um, you know nobody should take personally if you don't see a paper that you think belongs here in in my slides. And I would really appreciate it if you. Uh, you know, send me an email after this and say, hey, you know, are you aware of my paper? Uh, I think that, you know, it will, uh, it will, it's a nice contribution to this particular area and that, that will certainly help me make sure that in the future um, this, this, this kind of a presentation is, is more complete. So uh, without further ado, let me, let me get, get started. So just kind of as a little bit of motivation, uh, why should we study private firms? Uh, so from the point of view of uh, kind of uh, an audience like, like many of you, many of you who are interested in entrepreneurship, of course, all entrepreneurial firms start being privately held. Uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of, that gives us a starting point that is common to pretty much all the firms that, that we study. And those that are successful eventually face the decision of whether um, to go public or stay or stay private. Now, of course, this decision is not taken in a vacuum. Uh, these decisions, for instance, decisions that entrepreneurs take early in their life, uh, are gonna have a big impact on the circumstances that they face when the time comes and their uh, firm has matured enough where an IPO becomes an option. For instance, whether they have taken or not VC capital will have a, a big impact in the uh, circumstances that they face when an IPO is, is a possibility. Now, when we look at the data, as it turns out, uh, many firms actually end up staying private. Uh, so if you look just at the US kind of uh, firm count, you see that the vast majority of firms are not, uh, are not uh, public, uh, approximately 0.1% of the close to 6 million firms in the US are public. And this, this is true, of course, many of these are very small firms and nobody should be surprised that they are private. But this is true even when we look at relatively large firms, for instance, those with more than 500 employees. And if you look at private firms 
in terms of investment, in terms of uh, employment, uh, revenue, whatever measure you're interested in, you'll see that private firms account, you know, at least for 50%, and you know, in some uh, in some measures, uh, more than that of the kind of uh, U.S. economy. Now, of course, in other in other countries, this this is different, and actually, for instance, in European countries like Germany, Italy, Spain, uh, this kind of the the weight of private firms is even more more substantial than it is in in the U.S. Just just a quick word on on kind of the international aspect of of today's talk, uh, particularly when I talk about regulation, etc. The focus is going to be on the U.S. There's a lot of interesting stuff and a lot of interesting data coming out from Europe, uh, also Asia, uh, but kind of. To, to keep the, to the, today's discussion focused, I'm going to be focusing mostly on, on the US. Now, if you want to see kind of just in, in, a, in a picture, this is, uh, this is kind of all firms that have, again, in the US, uh, more than $3 million in revenue. Of course, below that, these are tiny firms, and you know, essentially all of them are going to be private. And this is a uh, log scale here. And what is interesting to see is that you really need to go to the a largest bucket, if you will, firms that have more than $3 billion in revenue to see uh, more public than private firms. And here you do see relatively few private firms. But until you get to this $3 billion in revenue, you see uh, many more uh, private firms than, than public, which again uh, kind of emphasizes this important weight of private firms in the US economy. And just kind of also a word of caution for pretty much everything that, that will follow. It's important to keep in mind that uh, the vast majority of private firms are not going to be a venture capital or private equity owned firms. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about VC and private equity, but just, you know, keep in mind that the vast majority of these firms, they are not, you know, VC back or pre back startups. Uh, so again, why, why should we care about uh, starting private firms? Now, of course, if you, you know, kind of, if, if you try to plot, you know, something like this, but instead of just looking at the, a weight of firms in the economy, you look at the weight of uh, public and private firms in finance research, you will actually see kind of uh, a very skewed distribution in the other direction, right? Uh, a lot of uh, our research focuses on, on private on public firms and private firms, they tend to be really underrepresented, uh, particularly once you get out of, you know, the entrepreneurial finance literature, which has historically paid more attention certainly to private startups. Now, of course, data availability is a big reason for this. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are some uh, data sources on private firms, particularly in, in Europe, certainly also in the US. Uh, but one thing that is that, that doesn't exist is that we don't have available is, for instance, in the case of the US, a compu staff for private firms that you know will allow you to easily go to WRDS and just you know download all private firms release all those that meet certain you know size or industry criteria. Now, does this matter? This kind of emphasis in the finance literature on public firms, well, it, it will not matter if the behavior of public firms is representative of that of private firms, or at least of the relevant subset of private firms, that, those that are you know, large enough, for instance, along the dimensions that you know, one is, is studying. However, when the behavior is not representative, if one simply extrapolates from public firms to private firms, that will lead to misleading conclusions. And I'll, I'll give a couple of examples during uh, during the talk of instances where, where this might might happen. Okay, so hopefully at this point, you know, you, you're convinced that it's worthwhile spending the next hour here. Uh, so let me uh, give you a bit more of detail about uh, kind of what's the agenda for today. I want to begin by essentially, um, well, I will begin with a definition and I think it's important to make sure that we are all on the same page when we talk about, you know, what is a public and what is a private firm. And then next, I'll talk about what is factually different between public and private firms. So really, what is you know what are the things regulation-wise or you know otherwise that are that are uh, different between public and private firms. And then I'll talk about try to link these kind of factual differences to economic differences, stemming from uh, from them. Then I'll also talk about kind of um, what are the differences in behavior that we observe in public and private firms along dimensions that we care in finance or corporate finance like investment, capital structure, cash, et cetera. And this will be a great uh, moment to obviously talk about identification challenges so that anybody who has you know, spent time working in this literature, I'm sure is uh, well, well aware of. And then finally, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the startup exit decision and try to uh, look at how it has changed over time and how, in a sense, these economic differences that we've talked about uh, between public and private firms kind of affect the, or influence the trade-off that an entrepreneur 
uh, faces when thinking about whether to go public, stay private, maybe sell the company to, to a larger, to another larger company. Okay, so let me let me begin with the definition, and uh, it's as you'll see, it's not maybe as obvious as as you might have uh, imagined, or at least there is some gray areas that it's important to be clear about. So, so a public firm is going to be a firm whose shares, uh, at least you know, in the definition that I'm going to be using in this talk. Uh, which you know doesn't mean that you need necessarily to agree, but this is, I think, the most common one that is used in, in the literature. Uh, a public firm is going to be a firm whose shares are listed in a major stock exchange. So in the case of the US, this is going to be uh, the NYSE, the NYSE American, which is kind of the Amex has been now bought by the NYSE, and the NASDAQ. And that's, uh, you know, and if you are looking at other countries like Germany, uh, the UK, China, you're going to need to kind of, you know, make sure that you come up with a set of uh, major ex stock exchanges in those particular countries. And then a private firm is going to be, in principle, is going to be all other private sector firms. So of course, here we're going to ignore, you know, government on entities, we should probably also ignore uh, nonprofits, etc. So that not, you know, not the kind of companies that we usually study in, in our in our setting. Now, it is important to be to be aware of the fact, though, that uh, there are some special types that one may want to treat differently or not. Uh, when one kind of makes this broad definition of private firm, meaning among the firms that are not listed in a major exchange. And there are two types of, uh, of kind of a special categories, so if, you, if you will, that I think it's important to be, uh, to be explicit about. So one, there are going to be firms whose shares are listed in, let's call them minor exchanges. And for instance, here you essentially have any over-the-counter kind of a, a exchange, a bulletin board, pink sheets, etc. Uh, this company OTC markets has kind of aggregated now a lot of these OTC kind of uh, exchanges and uh, what is interesting is that they have uh, three kind of within their company if you will they have three type of markets uh, that they where they try to run companies by in a sense the quality of at least the disclosure and the information environment that surrounds these companies they have the OTC QX which is kind of the best market think of this as you know, just one step below mass NASDAQ or the NYSE, the OTC QB, which is a venture market that they are kind of targeting to startups. I think that at the moment still not like super successfully, but it is out there. And then they have the uh, pink, which is essentially, you know, a market where pretty much anything goes. Uh, there's very little kind of, you know, uh, thresholds that one needs to meet to, to be listed here. Uh, a few papers have looked at these, uh, at the companies that are listed here. For instance, uh, there's a relatively recent paper in the RS RFS by Brueggemann and co-authors. They have a sample of around 10,000 firms. So this kind of gives us a, a sense of how big these, these OTC markets are between you know, one and, and 10. Uh, and and what, they, the, what they find, and this is something that you know, others have also found is that what you see in these markets is a mix of fallen angels and rising stars, which may, you know, if you are ever doing research in this twilight zone, as, some, as they, they call it, you need to be careful because you are going to, uh, or at least, you know, it's important to keep in mind that you're going to have firms that in a sense, you know, um, are startups that, you know, might be on the way to, uh, to having, let's say, a full-fledged IPO, and they've decided to first perhaps uh, list here on the, you know, venture market. And you're also going to have firms that have been delisted from the major markets, usually because they didn't uh, they meet one of the listing standards, and then they kind of their shares are now traded, you know, maybe here or you know more often here, and so these are what what they call these fallen angels. So again, these are technically by by this definition, these are going to be private firms because you know they, their shares are not listed on one of the three or two major exchanges, uh, but uh, but but obviously you know there is some exchange where you can take these firms or there is an exchange where you can take these firms. So you know depending on the kind of research that you are doing, you might want to be mindful about that. I, again, the number is not huge, but obviously there, for instance, there is more data on these firms than on you know some uh, many private firms that 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 are not listed anywhere. So uh, sometimes these firms you end up seeing them more in research than you would if you were just taking a random sample of firms because of data availability. And then another uh, kind of a special category of private firms, I would say, are uh, the private firms that have to file financial statements with the SEC. Uh, just to give you a sense, for instance, uh, Dow Hartford Ali in their uh, 2013 JFP paper, they have around 3,600 of these firms between 95 and 2011. So again, not, not a huge amount of firms, but a good quality on that. 
So again, they, you know, they've been studying a fair amount because of, of data availability structure in, in, in the US. Uh, two potential reasons why a private firm, i.e. a firm whose shares are not listed in, you know, in a major stock exchange might have to file financial statements with the SEC. One, uh, the firms might have publicly listed bonds. So a firm can choose to have publicly listed uh, bonds and then will have to um, file with the SEC as if it had publicly listed equity in a sense, but, uh, but because it has chosen to list its bonds. Um, these are around 1,000 firms, for instance, between 93 and 09, according to this paper by Anna Kofner and uh, Unway. And then the other more common, uh, more common reason will be firms that even though they don't have equity or debt that is listed, they, they have crossed the filing threshold that the, one of the, well, the filing threshold that the SEC sets, which currently is they have more than $10 million in assets and more than 2,000 uh, shareholders of record. Uh, before the Jobs Act, uh, that was uh, 500. So these are firms that um, kind of they've hit this, uh, this, this threshold that uh, makes them have to file and makes them be subject to very similar disclosure and, for instance, insider trading regulations as public firms, but um, that, you know, they might still choose not to have their uh, shares listed on a major exchange. So again, they are public, they are private according to this definition, but, you know, we have a lot of information on them. And, their uh, information environment is in some sense closer to that of public firms than, than private. So again, important to, to, be, to be aware of, of, of these two types of uh, special firms, uh, special private firms. Um, okay, so having uh, given this definition, let's now talk about what is factually different between public and private firms. So essentially, you know, what changes when a firm decides to lease, it leases uh, its shares on a major exchange? So um, kind of, uh, and here my focus is gonna try to be as factual, as close to you know, the regulations, to, 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 to the actual things that tangibly change uh, as possible. And then you know, I'll try to then link these to more like uh, kind of economic differences, you know, agency problems, that kind of stuff uh, that, that's gonna come next. Okay, so obviously just because the shares are listed on a major exchange, we would expect the share liquidity to increase uh, restrictions on the number or type of shareholders are lifted, uh, solicitation, i.e. advertising restrictions are, are listed. Um, so, of course, you know, the definition of a stock exchange is that they provide a centralized venue where investors can easily trade shares, officially and anonymously matching buying, uh, buyers and, and sellers. Uh, when, you know, when private firms issue securities, uh, they, 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 they need to be careful at making sure that they are able to, in a sense, remain private. And in order to do this, they need to meet one of the exemptions from registration of the Securities Act. So in, in practice, what this is going to mean is that what the firms are going to do, one of the most common exemptions from registration is the Rule 506 of Regulation D. Uh, now, comes in two flavors, uh, 506B, 506C, uh, that uh, in particular, one of the things that these regulations do is that they limit the sale of securities to accredited investors or up to 35 non-accredited investors in the case of 506B uh, without any limit on the offer size. And 506B also uh, prohibits general solicitation and advertising of the offering. So what this means essentially is that if a private firm wants to issue equity and not have to register and go through uh, kind of all the process of becoming an SSC filing firm, then it's gonna need to make sure that it meets one of these registration exemptions and in particular, then it's gonna it's gonna mean that it's gonna need to limit the offering basically to accredited investors. There's a few other exemptions. There's also regulation A and crowdfunding regulations that put less limit on the number or the type of investors, but they do limit the, the offer size. And then the, the securities that are sold in particular under rule 506 are gonna be restricted securities that are not going to be freely tradable, and oftentimes sales are gonna require company approval. So Kind of just again mechanically, what this is telling you is that if you are a private firm and you want to to remain private, when you can sell shares, of course you can do that. But when you do this, you need to make sure that you meet one of the exceptions from registration. And in particular, you know, oftentimes what this means is that you are going to need to largely limit your your uh, offering to accredited investors. And by the way, here you can see different colors. Uh, these are links that you can click. Uh, you know, I'm going to post the, the slides uh, on. on on, on the site, and then if you're interested, you can read more about all these, let's say, legal details. Um, 
So, so this is one major change that, that kind of just comes automatically. The moment you become a public company, you no longer need to worry about meeting these exemptions. And so you can essentially uh, sell shares to anybody who is willing to buy them. You can advertise, you can solicit, etc. Okay, what, what else changes, you know, in a very kind of mechanical way, if you will. So another important change is going to be the information environment. Uh, so uh, public firms, they must publicly file their uh, uh, financial statements with the SEC, in particular, uh, three types of uh, filings that I want to emphasize here. They're going to need to file an initial registration statement, Form S1, where they give a lot of uh, information about the company and what's been doing, you know, at least over the last two, three years. Uh, they are then going to need to file regular financial statements, 10Ks and 10Qs, every year in the case of Ks, quarter in the case of Qs. And then they are also going to need to file 8Ks, essentially disclosing certain material events that are defined by the SEC within four days of taking place. They are also going to need to give information or at least uh, shareholders that, uh, that, that cross certain ownership thresholds, 5% in particular, are going to need to make this information public. And then insiders of this of the companies, officers, directors, or 10% shareholders are going to be limited in their ability to transact in the shares of these companies. And they are going to need to essentially make sure that they disclose all transactions that they make within two days. So again, that essentially is telling you that the information environment surrounding a firm, the moment that the firm decides to list these shares on a stock market and as a result becomes a necessary filing firm, uh, changes. Again, uh, not all firms that are SSE filers are uh, firms that have listed the shares on a stock market. A firm might also become an SSE filing firm without listing, and that's if you cross those uh, thresholds of $10 million in assets and uh, up to 2,000 shareholders. But all firms that uh, list on a major exchange, then they all become automatically SSE filers. Another uh, important difference uh, when it comes to the information environment is going to be the fact that uh, the firm is going to be subject to insider trading laws and it's not going to be allowed to selectively disclose material information to investors that are that are not insiders. Uh, so the SEC wants to ensure a level playing field, in particular access to the same information among public firm investors. And for instance, regulation fair disclosure in 2000 formalizes and clarifies much, much, much of this. Um, and in particular, under Section 16, insiders must return any short term trading profits when they trade on, on, on a public firm. So all these kind of limits in the way how insiders can or how uh, the firm can communicate with investors and how insiders can trade the shares of the company, that's something that automatically changes when a company becomes an SSE filer, in particular via, via an IPO. Okay, uh, and then finally, uh, the regulatory environment. Of course, some of the things that, we, that I've just been talking about uh, regarding uh, Disclosure, of course, this comes through regulation, so you can see that as part of the regulatory environment. But also, there are there are uh, changes that have, for instance, to do with the governance. Uh, firms that uh, list in either the Nasdaq or the NYSE, they are gonna have to meet the listing requirements of the exchange. Uh, and the Nasdaq has several tiers. The NYSE just has uh, one tier. And in particular, for instance, in the least stringent Nasdaq tier, the firm is gonna have to have a certain size. Uh, there's different ways of meeting this size. For instance, the market value of the publicly held shares has to be above 15 million, or the market value above 5 million, but then net income uh, above uh, three quarters of a million, and the majority of independent directors in its board. So again, these are regulations that they don't come from the SEC. They come from the exchanges, from the two major exchanges, uh, and uh, they need to be met for a firm to be, to be able to list its uh, shares in, in the exchange. They also have then they don't just need to be made when you list, but also there are uh, uh, there are thresholds that you need to meet in order to be able to continue listing, and otherwise you are delisted. Uh, then the firm is also going to have to comply with federal regulations that apply only to public firms, like the disclosure regulations that we mentioned, but also, for instance, additional auditing and internal controls, as uh, in the case of the Sarbanes Act. The Act of uh, 2002. So many of, not all of them, but the vast majority of, of these additional controls put together in the Sarbanes Oxley Act, they affect only to public firms. Now, the firm is also going to be able to comply with the state regulations that apply only to public firms. Uh, for instance, uh, in just very recently, California has instituted a board diversity requirement uh, 
Uh, you can see that it's going to come into place over the coming years, but this only a place. This only applies to public firms that that are headquartered in 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 California. So then, this is another kind of automatic legal uh, change that, uh, in this case, only applies to California firms. At the same time, the firm is going to be exempt from most state blue sky laws that govern the issuances of of private securities. Now, since uh, 1996. Uh, private firms that issue private securities under uh, Rule 506, they were already exempt from these blue sky laws. But in the case of those that might have used Regulation 8, for instance, this is another change that happens when the company becomes, becomes public. Okay, so um, now from, from these previous three slides, if you will, from you know, these factual differences that hopefully we all can agree on that are the objective, if you will, facts that are different between uh, private and public firms. Now, you know, we are going to try to think about what are the economic differences that stem from, from them, of course, you know, barring any errors or omissions of kind of the legal stuff that I that I've described. Now, it's important to keep in mind is that some of these objective differences, as I mentioned, do not apply to the special type of private firms mentioned earlier. So when we think about the economic differences between public and private firms in the in the coming slides, it's if you are studying one of these particular subsets of private firms, then you need to be mindful that not all of the economic differences might, might apply to them. So now the, the next step is going to be uh, what are these economic differences between public and private firms that follow from the above objective differences. And so we are going to need uh, theory and or empirics in order to be able uh, to, to, to do this. And of course, uh, a lot of or kind of pretty much everything that I'm going to say in a sense, it's open to discussion, it's open to research. You might agree more or less on, you know, the economic uh, inferences that I'm making. And that's, that's you know, and that's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, what I've tried to do until now is to, in a sense, just talk about the laws, if you will, and hopefully, again, you know, absent factual errors that, you know, we should, we should all be on the same page on, on that. So before I, I jump to the economic differences, maybe this is a good moment to pause in case there are any clarifying questions. I don't see any hands, cool. but we'll give it a second, see if any other questions. Guess we're good. Okay. Awesome. Clarity. <laughs> <laughs> or a lot of confusion. <laughs> uh, so, um, so let me let me kind of begin by talking about the first economic difference, and of course, kind of the first one that it's almost like you know, uh, they're you know in your face staring at you is going to be that um, when a firm becomes public, it's going to have uh, better access to and a lower cost of, of capital, right? And in particular, when thinking about equity, I'll also talk about that in in in, in a minute. But to the extent that uh, the shares of uh, public firms, they are more liquid, it's easier, faster to buy and sell these shares. There's no restrictions on resale. Investors should be willing to pay more for that, right? I know that if I buy the shares of a public company and I need to sell because whatever, I need to spend the money, uh, I can just make a couple of clicks and you know the money is gonna be in my bank account uh, pretty much immediately or in a matter of a couple of days. With private firms, things are more complicated, kind of by design. And so all else equal, I should be willing to pay more uh, for to, to buy the shares of a public company than of a, let's say, identical private company. And that obviously translates into a lower cost of capital uh, for public firms. Now, of course, the fact that there's no limit on the number of shareholders, on uh, shareholder uh, types, et cetera, means that it should be easier to raise capital and it should be easier to have a well-diversified shareholder base that does not need to be compensated for, for bearing any idiosyncratic risk. Um, so, you know, you hear oftentimes that uh, private firms, particularly those, for instance, that are family firms, some of their decisions might be, in a sense, uh, affected by the fact that uh, those, that company represents a, a very large share of the um, assets of the owner, right? And that, in particular, can lead this owner to be perhaps more risk averse than in the case of, you know, the shareholders of public companies that we, we assume them to be generally like, you know, perfectly diversified. And so that, you know, in asset pricing terms, that means that uh, public companies should only, their valuation should only be depending on uh, systematic risk, whereas there is a place for idiosyncratic risk to kind of need to be compensated in the case of private companies. Of course, VC and P funds, they you know, try to, and in instances, they, they can get very close to replicating a lot of these diversification benefits. Um, of course, also the access to a larger pool of investors without any accreditation requirements, uh, no solicitation restrictions, 
means that it should be easier to raise capital, but also if you, and this is kind of an active area of research, but if you think that the, that the demand curves for the stocks slope down, and again, there's papers on all directions here, but that will, should also kind of, just because of that, uh, translate into higher stock, stock price. And uh, another difference, for instance, uh, before Nismia, the regulatory uh, burden of private firms grew with the number of states where shareholders resided due to the need to comply with the blue sky laws of these states. And so in then this will mean that many private firms, they kind of limited their shareholders to few states, which again, will further decrease the pool of investors and potentially, uh, you know, will further decrease the demand for, for their shares. Now, to my knowledge, I, I'm not aware of any paper that has kind of quantify the difference in the cost of capital, a particular cost of equity between public and private firms. Of course, you know, identification here is kind of a nightmare, but, uh, but also it's important to keep in mind that, um, you know, we, will, we expect this difference to not be, you know, just one single number, but you will expect it to increase with the firm's demand for capital because a lot of these, you know, uh, diversification issues that we've been talking about being more salient where you're trying to raise a lot of capital. Uh, and it's also uh, important to, to, to keep in mind is that, um, you know, a lot these difference could also change over time and, you know, there might be also differences across industries, etc. So, you know, we shouldn't expect just, just, just one, one number here. Now, this higher liquidity of the public firm shares is not only just implies that, it, you know, the cost of equity capital is going to be, is going to, uh, is going to be lower for them, but it's also valuable to the founders, to the employees, uh, particularly if they have a stock options to the initial investors, that is the VCs, uh, if they want to exit their investment, right? So this is kind of this higher liquidity in, in a sense, it's not just beneficial for the firm uh, uh, as a, you know, a, a, as a, you know, for the company that is trying to raise capital and finance investment, for instance, but it is also uh, beneficial for some of the particular early investors in, in the firms that might want to cash out. Uh, and in particular, for instance, we know this, this idea that, you know, a lot of the founders or employees of private firms have sometimes been called to be paper millionaires because, you know, they might uh, have shares that are worth, you know, in principle, a lot of money, but, uh, but it might be difficult for them to cash out and it might be difficult for them to, you know, just go and buy a house, for instance, because you cannot just, you know, pay with, with those private shares. Um, kind of consistent with this notion of, of this, uh, liquidity benefit being not just important for the firms themselves, but also for their founders and investors. Uh, but now can co-authors, they find that, uh, I think it's in Sweden or Norway, uh, Scandinavian country data, they find that undiversified founders are more likely to go public, all else equal. So that's, that's kind of another uh, economic advantage of public firms that kind of flows to, the, in, the, in this case, their, their, their founders. Now, of course, this also means that it may be easier for public firms to attract and retain um, employees, uh, because in a sense, they can offer uh, shares that are going to be more valuable to the extent that they are easier to trade. But it might also be easier to lose them if, you know, once uh, these employees can more easily cash out. So, you know, this guy can cut a little bit both ways when it comes, you know, the ability to attract and retain cap uh, human capital. Another, another kind of advantage coming from this higher liquidity and also, you know, a better price discovery, if you will, uh, that has been emphasized in the literature is the, the fact that public firms have an easier time using shares as a currency to pay for acquisitions. So again, related to, to the lower cost of capital, but in this case, you know, particularly in the case of, of acquisitions and more specifically uh, stock, stock acquisitions. Okay, so what about that? So until now, kind of, we talk about equity and a lot of these, in a sense, advantages, they seem to flow very, very naturally just from kind of the, the fact that uh, by definition, the firms of public firms are gonna be listed on an exchange. In the case of that, you know, you, you don't expect to see uh, any kind of just, in a sense, you know, direct difference because the debt in principle is not, uh, you know, it remains the, the, the same. Uh, but Sanders and, and Stefan, they, they show in looking at UK private firms that uh, they tend to pay higher loan spreads than, than public uh, ones, in particular 0 0.27 percentage points, which, you know, it's, 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 it's a substantial, I think it's around 20 percent of, of the average uh, spread. So why, why is this the case? 
and again, you know, here we're talking about uh, loans. So these loans remain private in a sense, both in the case, these are bank loans, both in the case of public or private companies. So they point to three kind of, if you will, indirect benefits from being public that flow to, to, to the debt holders in this case. So one is that the richer information environment surrounding public firms means that banks face a lower cost of information production when they are lending um, to public firms. And one way how kind of they point to the fact that this, that this difference in, seems to be important is the fact that the difference between the public and private firms uh, cost of debt seems to disappear when examining private firms that have issued public bonds uh, whose information environment is much more closer. It's much more similar to that of public firms. Another one is kind of just comes from an old fashioned, if you will, uh, bargaining power story. And the idea is that public firms, they have a greater bargaining power when negotiating with lenders because the lenders know that, you know, these firms, they, they have ease, uh, access to more and cheaper equity capital. So in a sense, that, that means that it can be helpful where they are negotiating with banks, even if kind of from the point of view of the bank, the, uh, you know, the debt securities look exactly the same whether they come from a public or from a private company. Uh, and then uh, finally, the higher ownership concentration in private firms which in principle, and you know, I'll talk more about this, can lead to less agency problems between managers and shareholders. We would also expect then this, that this will take to enhance uh, risk-taking incentives in, in, the case, in the case of uh, um, you know, private firms that have less agency problems. And in a sense, they are able to uh, kind of diminish this problem of enjoying the quiet life that has been known to affect at least some uh, the managers of some public firms. So, you know, the quiet life is, we think of it as not being good for the overall value of the firm, but it can be perfectly fine for lenders because of, you know, the different priority structure of their claims on the cash flows of, of the company. Um, so these are, uh, and consistent with this, with this idea of this ownership matter, uh, Saunders and Stefan, they show that firms that have more concentrated ownership, uh, they tend to pay higher spreads. So again, not just uh, lower cost of equity capital that in a sense flows directly from, from the listing difference, but also lower cost of debt capital uh, coming from this richer information environment, bargaining power, and also perhaps you know, agency problems or less agency problems between shareholders and debt holders. Um, so now that we're talking about um, Agency. So let's, you know, obviously this is, this is another big difference between public and private firms and here focusing on agency problems between uh, shareholders and, and, and managers. So the dispersed ownership and separation of ownership and control that in a sense flows directly from the fact that uh, the shares of public firms, they can are accessible to more investors. Oftentimes, as we saw in the case of the NASDAQ, the listing requirements kind of uh, force firms or uh, require firms to have, you know, large enough public flow. Their, their shares need to be held by a, a kind of sufficient number of outsiders, if if you will, means that uh, you are going to have more of a separation between the ownership, the shareholders, uh, typically, and the and the management, those that kind of control the company. And so, these obviously, you know, as we know from all the agency uh, papers out there. This means that. At least in some instances, management may choose to maximize its own um, objective function instead of doing what is best, let's say, for the value of the firm and its uh, shareholders. Um, of course, in public firms, the fact also that more shareholders are on these small stakes in the firm because of this diversification means that uh, for many of them, it, they might not be willing to pay the fixed cost of monitoring manager, management. And you know, there are, of course, solutions to many of these agency problems and, and the long agency literature has looked, looked at them. But um, to be clear, you know, agency problems, they can also exist in private firms, both between management and shareholders when these are, are uh, separate, but also between majority and minority shareholders, uh, some, something that has been emphasized, particularly in, you know, in countries where the rule of law might not be as strong as it is in, in the case of the US. Uh, but um, but you know, to the extent that the ownership is more concentrated and that in many private firms, we have little separation between ownership and control. This limits the scopes uh, for agency problems, right? In, in the limit, when you think about an owner-managed firm, there's there's no, no scope for agency problem there, right? Because the owner and the agent are the same person. Uh, now, even when uh, ownership and control are separated, though, uh, 
there is usually little information asymmetry in private firms between management and shareholders. And if you think about the case of VC firms, that you know that's that's very apparent, right? We know that VCs usually, uh, you know, they sit on the board, they have access to uh, you know management almost on a you know daily basis if if they choose to. Of course, that's not usually the, the case, but they have a lot to. They have a very much a direct flow of communication with the company, and this really kind of limits the extent of information asymmetry between private between the management of private firms and uh, shareholders. And of course, you know, without information asymmetry it's you know there's no scope for for agency problems so that's uh more hazard or otherwise so that's that's important to um to keep to keep in mind so having talked talk about agency let's kind of com continue also talking about the kind of implications of the uh, information environment differences between public and private firms and uh and, and one in and, and another implication is the Two audiences problem that can be faced by public firms uh, when they communicate with with investors and this goes back to Bhattacharya and Ritter in 1983 in the review of economic studies uh, and just kind of to explain these two audiences problem I think it's it's very helpful to just think about one one example um, suppose that uh, a firm figures out you know that search engines can be very profitable of course we're talking about let's say you know, 15 years ago uh, uh, 20 years ago, and if the firm is public, it, it's going to then face a two audiences problem. The firm can make the information public. Uh, this will, of course, increase the firm's valuation and it will decrease its cost of capital because shareholders will know that this firm is on to something, let's say. But it will also alert current and potential new competitors of the profitability of this search engine business. And so, you know, they might be more eager to try to also enter this, this particular area. Alternatively, the firm can keep the information private, the public firm can keep the information private, but this will likely mean that at least, you know, for some time, the firm is going to be undervalued because uh, shareholders out there, at least many of them, they won't be uh, aware of the fact that, you know, the search engine, engine business thing is really a very profitable uh, line of business. So this undervaluation can, to some extent, erode the cost of capital advantage of being public that we were discussing, can also damage potentially employee morale, particularly if, you know, they are shareholders, they have options. And uh, of course, you know, to the extent that the firm can, you know, gets very large, then it's going to be very, very difficult to keep, you know, this information private. But while the firm is still growing or, you know, relatively small, this, this, this two audiences problem can be, can be really, really acute. Now, in the case of private firms, they, they typically, they don't face this problem, right? They, private firms, they can communicate with selected investors. There's no limitations in the case of private firms in their ability to, you know, tell information to particular sets of investors and not to others. Um, and so that means that oftentimes the investors are going to be entirely on the same page with the management and the company on, you know, the value of any new uh, lines of work that they might be exploring. But again, in the case of, of public firms, they, they, they cannot. The private fir public firms are not allowed to just, you know, call up, uh, you know, the fund manager at Fidelity and say, hey, you know, you really, you, you, so, you, you said, or, you know, some, some advisor, you said that our company is not doing well, but, you know, actually we're doing great, we're investing in all this, and we have all these things uh, down the pipeline. Uh, that's, that's just literally not allowed in the case of a public firm that's prohibited by regulation fair disclosure. And, and so this gives rise to these two entities problem. Of course, public firms, they can make the information public, but then that would also be known to their competitors. Um, so just kind of to, to give you, uh, you know, an example of, of, of an instance where this kind of search engine uh, case uh, played out, uh, if you read Google's uh, S1 uh, in 2004, it says as a smaller private company, Google kept business information closely held, and we believe this helped us against competitors. And consistent with that, uh, in the Wall Street Journal article reporting on the S1, you know, there is this uh, VC uh, called Mitchell Kretzmann that says the numbers are stunning, uh, the profitability number, so essentially, uh, you know, suggesting that many investors out there, even sophisticated VCs, they, they really were not aware of the fact that the search engine business had become such a profitable uh, business, right? That there were questions around the Google's ability to monetize their, uh, their business early on, and it looks like uh, Google had actually done more progress in their monetization strategy than actually many outside investors were giving it credit for. So this, in particular, this, this can open public firms to short-term expressions. Uh, again, you know, uh, another active research area, uh, and, you know, one where I support myself, so you might, you know, be, want to be mindful that I, you know, I might not have, come with a completely kind of blank slate kind of mind to this, to this topic, 
But, uh, but in my mind, at least, there are three fundamental differences between public and private firms that can accentuate these short-term risk pressures on the part of, of public firms. So one is this two audiences problem that we were discussing, they accentuate the information asymmetry between the firm and public firm uh, stock market investors and also potentially analysts. And one important thing to keep in mind is that essentially any model of short-termism, Steins or any other that you look at is gonna require some information asymmetry, right? If everybody can see what everybody else is doing, then there's no way for any kind of you know, difference between the long-term and the short-term value of the firm. So you need some information asymmetry and kind of one perhaps counterintuitive thing to keep in mind is that although private firms are, of course, more opaque to the general public than public firms, uh, one could argue that they are actually, when it comes to their investors, they, they are less opaque because, again, there is no limit in the flow of information between, uh, between private firms and, and investors in the way that you face it in the case of public firms because of these two audiences problem. Uh, another kind of potential avenue through which the short term risk pressures can, can be felt is uh, the fact that public firms kind of by definition, they have little control over their shareholder base, right? Once the shares are listed, anybody can buy them, sell them. And so they might end up with short term oriented investors, whereas we do know, at least anecdotally, that in the case of private firms, they, they are, tend to be very careful in selecting who is going to be an investor and, you know, they try to make sure that the goals are aligned, etc. So that's another difference. Uh, and then finally, of course, the quarterly earnings disclosure cycle can accentuate the pressure to meet short term forecasts, potentially at the expense of long term investments and kind of private firms, they, they just don't face this kind of short term forecast is uh, having to be the quarterly EPS targets, etc. So these are three, if you will, uh, three, three ways how these fundamental differences between public and private firms can, can lead to uh, stronger short term pressures for public firms. If in the case of uh, Google S1, they also discuss, uh, you know, this, this idea that as a private company, we have concentrated on the long term and discuss that as well. And as a public company, you know, they say that they will do the same. And just to make sure, you know, they say, well, hopefully our investors, they will also take this long term view. But in case they don't, we just set up this dual class structure so that we can ignore them as much as, as possible. Uh, so it kind of that was Google's way of, you know, trying to insulate itself a bit from the short term pressure that might come from the market by retaining uh, more control than they will have otherwise without this dual class. Okay, so uh, just, you know, summarizing, I think, uh, you know, in one slide and adding a couple of uh, differences that, that are, you know, that perhaps the list that, that, I, that I haven't still mentioned, uh, public firm advantages, lower cost of equity and debt, and better access to capital, easier exits for founders, investors, uh, easier to use shares as currency for acquisitions and higher reputation and visibility with customers and potential partners. In the case of public firm, the uh, kind of the risk and the cost will be agency problems, uh, the two audiences problems, short term risk pressures, uh, higher potentially also higher litigation risk. Uh, some recent research out there emphasizing this, both in the case of maybe patent lawsuits, but also frivolous securities action uh, lawsuits production lawsuits, and then also, of course, just, you know, high expenses that come both from the IPO, but also ongoing auditing investor relationships, etc. Okay, so um, again, this is another good place for questions, if you have any. Uh, now, I want to kind of, you know, having talked about the economic differences, I want to talk about some of the differences that we observe in the behavior of public and private firms when it comes to investing, innovating, uh, the way how they, you know, capital structure, uh, cash, etc. Not sure if we have any questions. So I'll, I'll, I cannot hear you, Michael, but I'll keep going. I think you're good. Okay, uh, I don't cool. see any hands. It's been pretty clear. Um, okay, awesome. Great. Um, so, so let's begin with, uh, again, these are the kind of different aspects that I want to touch on. Let's begin on uh, with investment. There's been a, a long literature out there that has kind of compared the investment of public and private firms. This literature has uh, mostly focused on comparing the sensitivity of investment to investment opportunities. Uh, how do you measure them for private firms? Of course, we don't have to be skew for private firms. So typically uh, people use sales growth or maybe some more ad hoc industry specific measure in the case of studies that focus on particular industries. And here we have two main competing hypotheses, right, from the previous differences that we were uh, highlighting. So on the one hand, the fact that public firms have better access to and lower cost of capital, so you can think of this as 
a lower financial constraints, uh, will suggest that uh, public firms they will be able to invest more efficiently and be more responsive to more responsive to investment opportunities. On the other hand, the short-term pressures that uh, we were discussing could distort the investment decisions of public firms, uh, leading them to be less responsive to, to such investment opportunities. Of course, and this is this is important here. Both can be true, and both are likely true, right? And ultimately, when you know, if we just compare the investment of public and private firms, which effect is going to end up dominating is likely to change depending on which industries you focus on, depending, for instance, on time periods. And you know, different authors have have emphasized this. So. Um, you know, these, these, these two are likely to matter, these two kind of competing hypotheses, and then it's just a matter ultimately, you know, which one seems to matter most uh, in certain sets of firms or during certain time periods. So uh, given this, you know, you probably should be surprised that kind of the, the literature has found different types of results. Uh, we, uh, several papers have in general found higher investment sensitivity uh, higher investment sensitivity to investment opportunities for public firms. Uh, and most of, essentially all of them emphasize this notion of, you know, private firms are more financially constrained. Uh, they have, you know, uh, access to less and, uh, and more expensive capital. And this uh, limits their ability to take advantage of new investment, investment opportunities. For instance, uh, Mortal and Rizal, uh, they use uh, European data again, where in general we, we have better quality data on private firms. And they find that, uh, yes, private firms are less sensitive to investment opportunities, but this difference is driven by countries with well-developed stock markets, which kind of points to this advantage of public firms when they are in a well-developed stock market like, like the US. Uh, Gilgi and Tayyard in the JF, they look at the natural gas industry and they find that uh, public firms, they tend to respond more to new discoveries of uh, natural gas. And that, that seems to be driven again uh, by um, financial constraints. Uh, Philips and Sertius, they look at uh, firms' ability to kind of re, re, react to new Medicare national coverage approvals in, in the uh, medical industry. And they find, again, that public firms, they, they tend to be able to, to react faster to this, to this approval. And a couple of uh, recent working papers have also found results in, in the same direction. Uh, two papers that have found kind of the opposite direction, uh, one of uh, them, uh, uh, mine with uh, John Asker and Alexander Lundis, we look at uh, data from Sage Wars, a large multi-industry sample of firms, and here we find uh, less investment uh, sensitivity for public firms, particularly in industries where stock prices are more sensitive to earnings news, so where we expect the short-term pressures to be strongest, where kind of firms know, public firms know, that if they miss the quarter, they are going to face a hard hit on their, on their stock price. Uh, very recently, uh, uh, the paper has been around for, for a while, but uh, very recently published, uh, Albert Chin, uh, he converts investment of, uh, the investment of public and private firms in the chemical industry and find that private firms, they seem to be more likely to increase capacity prior to positive demand shocks and less likely before a negative shock, pointing to uh, agency problems and perhaps also extrapolation of public firms. Uh, if in terms, in, instead of looking at uh, investment in the sense of capex, if we focus on M&A, uh, Maximovich, uh, Phillips, and Young, they also find important differences between public and private firms. They find that public firms, they tend to participate more as buyers and sellers of assets in major waves, and they seem to be more affected by credit spreads and aggregate market valuation. So now let's let's talk about innovation. A um, couple of, uh, of, of papers, uh, Acharya and Chu, they look at uh, compare public and private firms, and they find that public listing seems to facilitate the innovation of firms in industries that are more dependent on external capital uh, because of, you know, the, the access to, to, to equity. Um, interestingly, what, what they also find is that um, this suggests that, you know, in industries where there's not a lot of demand for external capital, perhaps this uh, exposure to short-termism might actually reverse the, the advantage, if you will, of, of public firms. Uh, they look at uh, patents and r and that dependent variable, and they use uh, private firms uh, from capital IQ. So again, this particular type of private firms that are SEC filers. Uh, Gao, Su, and Li, um, they look at uh, the extent to which the, not just the, if you will, quantity of innovation or quality, but just also the type of innovation changes uh, uh, or differs between public and private firms. And they show that public firms patents like more than existing knowledge are more exploitative and are less likely to be in new technology classes, while private firms patents are broader in scope and more exploratory. Uh, 
suggesting that the shorter the investment horizon uh, might be might be a factor in the case of public firms. Uh, another important paper uh, in this literature is uh, by Shai Bernstein in 2015. But uh, before talking about this, I think this is a good moment for me to kind of uh, jump into discussing uh, identification. Because you know we've talked already about several papers that have compared public and private firms. But now the question, of course, is you know how do we know that these differences that we observe between public and private firms are really about the listing status uh, instead of just being driven by some unobservable differences between the public and the private firms. For instance, one obvious difference could be uh, firms precisely go to public when they have good investment opportunities because they want to take advantage of you know, cheaper capital. And so it's actually the investment opportunities that largely or exclusively explain the differences in their investment, not so much you know, the listing status itself. So this is, you know, it's, it's a big challenge in this literature. Um, what can you do to address it? Uh, a few things. Uh, so the one thing that pretty much everybody does in some form or shape is going to be matching. And the reason is that if you don't, you're going to end up with firms that look very different just in terms of things like size, industry distribution. And so it can be difficult to just you know, make very meaningful comparison in the face of such uh, large differences. Now, of course, the, the challenge with matching is that one can only match on observables. And so unobservable differences remain. And, uh, and, and we know that in, you know, when you still have unobservable differences, matching is not going to recover a causal effect. Uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's a limitation that is, you know, we need to be aware of. But again, I think usually matching is, is at least it, it helps you zero in on firms that look similar and therefore you know, more easily comparable than if you just don't do any, any matching. A couple of, of uh, uh, more approaches more. So one has been to focus on firms that either go from private to public, be an IPO or that the list and go from public to, to private. Now, the advantage is that essentially this allows you to differentiate away any time invariant and observable differences. The challenge, of course, is that these IPOs, the listing may be motivated by some unobservable stuff that is time changing. And so in this case, you won't be able to address the to address the, these things just by essentially you know, having firm fixed effects. Uh, but that's you know, it's still, still helpful. And some people you know, have tried to maybe you know, give a new twist to just uh, looking at transitions. Achari and Chu, they try to exploit um, a regression discontinuity around uh, listing standards as, as the force invariable. Uh, in my paper with Asker and Lungvis, we try to focus on secondary IPOs uh, and the idea is that these are less likely to be motivated by changes in investment opportunities because the firm doesn't raise any capital to invest, presumably. Um, finally, of course, you, you can do an IV. Now, you know, my honest assessment is that there's really no silver bullet uh, IV out there for the going public decision. Uh, you know, it's such a fundamental decision that it's, it's, you know, it's easy to think that there's anything that is going to be, you know, 100% exogenous here. Still, one can try, and people have tried. Uh, people have exploited geography-based IVs, IVs at the industry level. So, you know, there are things that you can try to do. Uh, you need to be mindful, you know, whether you are in, in the US, uh, you can exploit differences across states and uh, the UK, etc. So that's, you know, that's, that's, that's out there. And I think, you know, if nothing else, uh, you tend to get some brownie points for trying, even if, you know, nobody has ever I would say nobody has ever thought about you know any of these papers listed here as being like you know textbook examples of clean identification. Uh, of course, another thing to to keep in mind, and I think that this is something that the literature in general will do a better job of, of is, you know, if you if you take seriously your IV, you need to be aware of the fact that what you're going to be identifying is going to be the latter, the local average treatment effect of your compliers. And so, you know, this, this will matter if you think there's meaningful heterogeneity in the effects of being public on the outcome that you are studying. So that's, that's something that I think it's important to be meaningful of and not just, you know, checking the box of saying, I have an IV and my results go through. Um, but that's, that's just me. Um, and then, um, so now let's, let's talk, talk about Chai's paper because that's, in my mind, that is the the exception, let's say, in this class, this is a paper that does have good identification and that you know you could study as an example of, of a well-identified paper. But of course, there's no free lunch here. And in a sense, this comes from having a narrower focus, if you will, less external validity. So given that it's so hard to instrument for the decision to go public, what Chai does is uh, say, well, okay, let me keep the decision constant. 
I'm just going to compare firms that they have all tried to go public, but then I'm going to just look at exploit exogenous variation and the extent to which whether they are able or not to complete their IPO. So you keep constant the IPO decision, and then you exploit variation coming from fluctuations in the NASDAQ on whether the firms are actually able to complete the IPO and therefore become public companies, or whether they have to end up withdrawing, canceling their IPO, and so they stay as private companies. Um, and again, I think that you know, with, with the NASDAQ IV, I think that gives you a, a, a good shot at saying that you have good identification here. But, uh, but of course, you need to be mindful of the fact that then uh, you are comparing public firms with firms that stay private but have tried to go public. And the question then is, you know, how representative are firms that have tried but failed to go public from all other private firms out there? And again, there's never free lunch, uh, but, but certainly I think it, it is progress to know exactly uh, you know, to, to know that you have a well-identified uh, effect, even if it, you know, pertains to a narrower set, set of firms. Uh, what does Shai uh, find? He finds no change in the amount of innovation measured by patents. He does find a lower quality of innovation uh, for public firms. He also finds turnover uh, kind of in, in, in human capital, in, in, if you will. Key inventors seem to be more likely to leave when firms are able to complete their IPOs. And uh, this effect is to some extent eased by hiring of new investors. And there's some evidence that these effects are mitigated, mitigated when the CEO is also the chairman of the board. So to the extent that these firms are more insulated from kind of career concerns or short-term pressures, this suggests that part of it might be at least driven by agency prob problems that affect firms that are able to complete their, their IPOs. Uh, just in one slide, more differences between public and private firms. Uh, Private firms, they tend to have higher leverage. They tend to have less cash, uh, which is one of these things that are perhaps surprising because within public firms, uh, smaller and riskier firms, and you know, usually we think of private firms as being smaller and riskier than public ones, they tend to actually have more cash. Uh, two reasons out there, uh, higher agency problems might actually explain why public firms have more cash because they, they hoard it. Uh, that, uh, that's from now. Um, uh, Harvor and Lee in the JFE um, 2013, uh, looking at capital IQ private firms. I have a, a paper, and published paper, that argues that uh, public firms, they hold more cash for precautionary reasons because they don't want to find themselves having to raise capital when a new investment opportunity arrives, given that they face this two audiences problem that might lead them to be undervalued. Uh, we also know that public firms, at least in the case of the UK, which is the data that this paper uses, they tend to pay uh, more, more smooth uh, dividends, private firms less smooth. And we also know there are differences in turnover rates of CEOs and uh, turnover performance uh, sensitivity uh, between public and, and private firms. And short-termism seem to also be uh, a factor here. Just an, an aside, I, I haven't said anything about LVOs. Uh, this is, you know, this might just be one uh, WEFI lecture maybe for next year on, on, on its own. One thing to keep in mind is that Many LVOs are not are essentially private to private, but around 20-25% of them are public to private. So, you know, in a sense, they, they give us a, a useful point of comparison between you know the same firm being public and private, of, of course, in a very non-random kind of set of circumstances. Uh, people out there, you know, a very well-known paper in the AER finds that buyouts they tend to lead to essentially modest job losses, but but a lot of kind of kind of redistribution of uh, creation and destruction of employment and uh, some productivity gains. Uh, Shai, uh, Shai Bernstein and Al Sheen, they look at, um, at companies that essentially are fast food restaurants and they find that those that go through a PE buyout, they tend to be cleaner, have better uh, practices compared to those that are uh, franchises that gives them nice identification. Uh, more recently, uh, Gupta um, and, and co-authors, they, they look at PE buyouts in the in nursing homes and in this case actually you kind of see the opposite that you see in restaurants you see a uh, kind of uh, uh, an issue in declining patient health and compliance standards uh, for those that go through a buyout and one thing that these these authors emphasize is that the fact that in the kind of nursing home industry there's a kind of the client is not always the same person that that pays that might kind of distort the incentives that PE uh, the investors face when making investment in this industry in a way that is different, for instance, that in uh, kind of consumer uh, driven industries like, like restaurants. So I think I have 
for five minutes. Let me just kind of uh, talk about the exit decision and uh, how it has changed over time. And then I'll just have one slide with, uh, with concluding thoughts. So startup exit. One thing that, that I think is important to, to keep in mind and kind of um, is that there's really no, there's no regulatory, there's no other reason why a startups needs to exit, right? Or why it needs to go public or why it needs to be acquired. The firm will stay private forever. Uh, I mean, you know, forever is a long time, but uh, for as long as, as, as we can think of. Uh, for instance, you know, one of the, I think the largest company in the US private company is Cargill. And you know this company was founded in 1865, and it's still uh, it's still private, and it's still in the hands of the founding families. So um, there's no mechanical reason why a company will need to to go public or be acquired at some point. But of course, if a firm has raised, for instance, venture capital, venture capital, then we do know that this is they do face you know they they do face a, a timeline. They are on a clock to exit their investments. And so these type of companies that have raised uh, VC money, they are likely to, to face pressure to exit so that the VCs can return uh, the capital to their, to their investors, to their LPs. And of course, two main types of uh, exiting, uh, an IPO or a sale to another company or to another uh, financial acquirer. So IPOs, they tend to be at least historically the ones that give the better returns to, 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 to VCs. And so that's, you know, that's seen usually as the as the gold standard, if you will, of, uh, of the VC exits. Now, what we've seen in recent years is that we have seen a sharp decline in the number of IPOs in the US, in the US starting around you know, 1996. Um, and and we've, we've also seen what kind of we call, if we just not only look at IPOs, but if you will look at the number of private firms relative to the size of the US, I think in their case, they scale it by uh, the population of the countries. We have seen also uh, what, uh, a Dodge Caroli and Schulz, they call a listing gap. Uh, essentially, we see that in the US, we tend to see less firms being public than, uh, than we see in, in other countries, even if you keep a constant uh, sample of kind of developed uh, economies. And they argue that this seems to come both from these less IPOs that, that we talked about earlier, but also from, from increasing in the listings. And it's 45, 46 the, the listings and 54% the, the IPOs. There's a recent working paper by Espen Egbo and Lethal where they say that if you actually follow the assets through m through as then this merger adjusted listing gap is, is actually smaller. Uh, but uh, so, so again, it all depends on exactly what you're counting, whether you're counting firms, whether you, you're trying to count, count assets. But okay, let's go back to, to the IPO, which is the most relevant part of you know, this, this listing gap, at least when it comes to uh, thinking about startups. Um, so, so why have we seen this decline in IPOs? A couple of papers have, have looked at this. Uh, Gao, Ritter, and Zhu, they talk about essentially economies of scope that have made it more advantageous for firms to get big fast. And so this has made them more likely to go for an exit via acquisition as opposed to trying to grow as an independent company and eventually go, go public. And if you look at the type of conditional on exit, exiting, if you look at the type of exits that you see, you do see a decline in, I, in, in, in IPOs and an increase in M&A exits. Uh, one thing that Deutsche Crowley and Schulz emphasize is that it really this seems to have been a US driven phenomenon, uh, which on the one hand uh, kind of, uh, you know, you might think raises maybe some, or at least, you know, you have to think about stories when it comes to economies of the scope uh, that will be more US specific, uh, because otherwise if it's just something, you know, uh, about worldwide technology, it's not obvious then why this, uh, this phenomenon will be uh, mostly driven by, by the US, uh, by US firms. Both papers do agree that changes in the regulation of public firms, and in particular, sentiments Oxley uh, are, are unlikely to, to be driving this, this these, these changes. And in a recent paper uh, with Michael, uh, who, is, who is also here, what we what we show is that um, perhaps the instead of focusing so much at changes in the public environment, we should look at changes in the in the private environment, in the private markets. One thing that we 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 show that is uh, that that I think is interesting is that firms are taking longer to exit. And as a result, if you look at the status of firms, for instance, seven, 10 years after first raising venture capital. You see more and more firms going uh, staying private, uh, so it is true that conditional on exiting firms, you know, tend to nowadays favor M&As over IPOs. But actually, it's not like firms are now exiting at the same rate; just that they only do it now via via M&As. 
what we what we are seeing is that actually there is an increase in the firms that seven, 10 years after first uh, raising capital, they are still private. They still have an exit, you know, near neither via uh, an M&A nor via, via an, an IPO. Now, why is this? So we argue that regulatory changes, in particular NISMIA 1996, uh, have made it easier uh, for private companies to stay private and still raise large amounts of capital. Uh, and in particular, one of the things that we've also seen, for instance, uh, Paul Lori and Kian document, this has also led to new investors uh, that traditionally had focused on, on the public markets also now being more active players in the private markets. And so you hear mutual funds investing in startups, et cetera, which you know, in essence has made it possible for firms to raise large amounts of capital uh, while still remaining private in a way that you know, in the past was much harder. And so firms that wanted to grow fast, that wanted to, to raise large amounts of capital, they found themselves kind of pushed over either going public or just being bought by another company, in particular, uh, a public, a public one. So that's all I have. I think I'm two minutes over time, so uh, it's a good time for me to give some parting thoughts. I think that starting private firms is is important. Many are certainly all startups start being being private. Causality is a challenge if we want to think. You know how being public affects uh, you know certain policies, investment, capital structure, or whatever it is. But that shouldn't stop from us from doing it. And you know if I may say, you know. As, having referred a fair amount of papers in this literature, one thing that I think is important is to try to be very explicit about, you know, what is fundamentally different between public and private firms and try to kind of follow as closely as possible the causal chain, you know, between these fundamental differences, regulatory or otherwise, and then the outcomes that one is interested in, in studying. Uh, and I think that this, you know, of course, identification still remains a challenge, but this, this can, can end up uh, kind of uh, at least giving some convincing evidence that that the the channels that one is 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 trying to identify are really out there one one opportunity also out there is to exploit these kind of special types of private firms since uh, you know some of them are in between public and private and so that that can allow some useful kind of variation on certain dimensions of being public while keeping others still private if if you if you will now uh finally there's you know a lot of ongoing changes in the public versus private trade-offs, uh, for instance, you know, this uh, growth in the private markets and, you know, a lot of uh, research around, you know, how they are impacting the exit decisions or, of uh, IPOs, how they are affecting the incentives of, you know, VCs and other startup uh, uh, in investors. Just a couple of things I will, I will say in concluding. One is that I think that one thing that has become clear is that it is not obvious that, you know, just the fact that we see less IPOs is necessarily a problem that needs fixing. But it is clear that it does change things and it has important implications in particular, you know, in the extent to which mom and pop investors might be able to access private uh, markets or might be able to invest in these companies that now they are able, that now they are staying private longer. Uh, particularly if you keep in mind that, you know, there's been a fall in the fine contribution plans for retirement assets that historically had invested, you know, in private equity, venture capital. But now if we are all on the fine, uh, uh, sorry, it's a fall in the fine benefit. If we are all now in the fine contribution and our you know, portfolio all includes essentially index funds that invest in public companies, then that, that makes it uh, difficult for many of us to take advantage of the investment opportunities that, that exist in this, in this, in this uh, growing side of the economy, if you, if you will. And finally, uh, you know, one thing that, that it's also good to keep in mind is that a lot of energy goes into regulations that affect only public firms with the California board diversity regulations uh, being the, lay, the latest example. And you know, it's important to keep in mind that this, this, this effect, these regulations impact uh, you know, potentially shrinking set of firms, if not in the terms of assets, certainly in the terms of you know, number of firms and uh, perhaps also employee count. So that's, that's something that is, that is important to, to, keep, to keep in mind. And with that, I'll just stop here. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm, I'm going to stay here for a while. Wonderful. Thank Thanks so much, Sean. That was a excellent lecture. Uh, obviously, I've had a play to part in it with you, but I learned a lot. Um, for those of you who uh, may have to step out, may have had to step out or anything, don't worry. We've recorded the lecture, and I assume Juan will let me post his slides. Yes. So, uh, so um, I look forward to putting that online. If anyone has a question, just uh, raise your hand. I can um, make sure we have an orderly set of questions, but feel free to ask away and. If you're leaving, um, just a reminder, next week we have one more uh, seminar uh, in the workshop. So check out our website and look out for an email for that.
So anyway, Joanne will be around uh, for questions. Sure.